Shalom and welcome to the One God Report podcast. Bill Schlegel here. This podcast is a response to a video made by the One for Israel organization. The video has a couple of names. One is the Trinity and the Torah, and also they call it a Jewish defense of the Trinity. And I have an interest in videos from Israel. I lived in Israel for 34 years, taught Bible, geography, history, Hebrew, biblical backgrounds, the life of Christ. I know some of the folks associated with the Israel College of the Bible, which the One for Israel people are connected with. I haven't met Dr. Seth Postel or Golan Broshi, who are in this video, but if they'd be interested in communicating personally sometime, I'd be interested. I actually plan to be in Israel the end of April and the first part of May, so maybe we can be in touch. Now, there are a lot of things in the video that I think are speculative and wrong. I'd probably be stopping the video every 15 seconds to respond to every problem. Instead of doing that, I'll plan to narrow my response down to about four or five topics. First, they start this video out by saying that this is a hot topic, and they quote a couple of Jewish people that say there's no way that the Trinity is in the Torah, and the ideas of the deity of Messiah or the triune God or the incarnation of God becoming man, these just aren't possible in the Jewish understanding of who God is. And then eventually they're going to quote one Jewish scholar that thinks that the Trinity might be a possibility. We'll get to him in just a second. But it's interesting to note that the two guys here in One for Israel know that this is a hot topic, and they kind of almost kind of laugh at the idea that, wow, can the Trinity be in the Torah? And my question would be, why is this such a hot topic? If God declared that he or they are a trinity, open up the Torah and show where. Case closed. So it's a hot topic because there is no place in the Torah where such a declaration is made. In fact, the declarations in the Torah about who God is contradict a multi-personal God idea. At one point, Golan says the idea that the Jews could never accept the Trinity or an incarnation of God, this is the stumbling block for the Jewish people. Now, from my perspective, as a person who believes that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, who was raised from the dead, here's the problem. I suggest teachings like this One for Israel video create a man-made, non-biblical stumbling block for Jewish people preventing Jews from hearing the true declaration of who the Messiah, Jesus, is. The ideas of the triunity of God, God becoming man, they're not stumbling blocks for the Jewish people in the Bible. The New Testament says specifically what the stumbling block for the Jewish people is, and it's not the triune God or the deity of Messiah, the stumbling block that is described in this One for Israel video is non-biblical. This is something that's been created by man. And the Jewish people are completely right for rejecting these ideas of a tri-personal God and a God becoming man. They're absolutely correct in rejecting these ideas. The stumbling block for Jewish belief, as the New Testament describes, is very clear. And it's not the things that Seth and Golan mention in the video. The Apostle Paul writes what the stumbling block for the Jewish people was in the Bible. Paul says to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 23, but we preach Christ, that is Messiah, crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles folly. This was the stumbling block for the Jewish people in the first century, not the triunity of God, which is a much later construct, not the idea of God becoming man, which is as well a much later construct, in the New Testament times, the stumbling block for the Jewish people was a crucified Christ. So the triune God and the deity of Christ are man-made stumbling blocks. And actually to declare that these are the stumbling blocks for Judaism in the time of the New Testament really makes the Apostle Paul a liar. If we look in the book of Acts chapter 26, beginning in verse 22, where Paul is giving his testimony before the Roman procurator Festus, and Herod Agrippa II. Paul says that he stands there before them testifying, 
quote, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles, unquote. This is what Paul was proclaiming. He wasn't proclaiming a triunity God. He wasn't proclaiming a God becoming man. He was proclaiming nothing but what Moses and the prophets said would come to pass, that the Christ would suffer and would be the first of the resurrection from the dead. That's the issue in the New Testament. None of this other stuff that Seth Postel and Golan Broshi are going to talk about in this video. In the video, the One for Israel guys keep talking about the mysterious unity of God. And they keep repeating this idea that there's a mysterious unity of God, as if there's more than one person who is God in the Bible. But once again, this so-called mystery is man-made. Here are some examples of them mentioning this mysterious unity of God. Okay, so what about the Torah teaching about God mysteriously, mysterious unity? What yeah. about his unity? You'll notice that there is this mysterious unity of God. So if you look at the mysterious unity of God, this mysterious unity of God. The teaching about the mysterious unity of God? So firstly, the mysterious unity of God, by saying that there's a mysterious unity to God, it's really interesting. Summer calls the mysterious unity of God fluidity. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wow. That word fluidity, that's the word that's used in modern times for transgender, non-binary people. There's a fluidity in their gender. Anyway, if you're interested in thinking about it, you can see One God Report podcast number 48, the Dual Nature Jesus, and number 73, Trinity Preferred Pronouns, He, Him. But this idea of a mysterious unity of God, it's not a mystery in the Bible. There's nobody that ever says in the Bible, Old Testament for sure not, New Testament for sure not, oh, there's a mystery in how there can be more than one person in one God. Go ahead, find anybody in the Bible talking about the mysterious unity of God and how it's a mystery that God can be more than one person and yet still be one God. Jesus, for instance, in the Sermon on the Mount, didn't say, now, folks, I want to tell you, I know, it's hard for you to understand, but this is a mystery, that God is more than one person. And, by the way, I am one of the persons who is the God of Israel. Or the Apostle Paul didn't write an epistle saying, now, I want you to understand this mystery, brethren, that God is three in one, that the Son is God, the Father is God, and the Spirit is God. There is a mysterious unity of God. It's a mystery. Now, this is not a mystery that's presented in the Bible at all. This idea of the mystery of more than one person in one God, it's a post-biblical concept. It comes from centuries after the time that the New Testament was written. And, by the way, its origin is from outside of the land of Israel. If this had been a mystery in the time of the New Testament, there would be no end of discussion about it the presentation by the biblical authors, and of opposition to the idea from those who opposed the presenters. But what we have in the Bible is absolutely nothing about a mysterious unity of God. Neither the deity of Christ or the triune God are discussed at all. So there's no mysterious unity of God in the New Testament. This is a totally post-biblical topic. Now, what the two guys do is they start to look in the Old Testament for some circumstantial evidence that somehow God is a triune being. And it really is. It's circumstantial evidence. There's no prophet. Of, of course, Moses didn't describe God as being three persons in one God, or there's no other prophet that said, oh, God is three persons in one God. So all this evidence, is it's not even really circumstantial. It's kind of like hints and clues that they want to somehow think that they see a possibility of a tripersonal God in these few scriptures they go to, and the scriptures can be understood in much better ways. One of the things they claim is that there's some kind of a fog or mystery about who God is, about how many persons God is, and how God is represented. 
they never mention the idea of agency, that God can be represented by the agent or the messenger that God sends. And this is so important to understand. Once a person understands agency, all this fog and misunderstanding about who's speaking, who's doing the works, is there another Yudhe Vavhe that isn't Yudhe Vavhe, but is Yudhe Vavhe? All this fog just totally lifts, and you can understand what's going on here in some of these Old Testament passages. The idea of agency is, is simply that it, a person's agent, the one sent, is regarded as the person himself. There's even kind of a proverbial statement in Hebrew, Ashaliach shave l'sholcho. The one sent is equal to his sender. The agent was equal to his sender, not in essence or in individual identity. Everyone knew that the one sent was not literally the one who sent him, but the one sent had been given equal authority to act on behalf of the one who sent him. A person's agent is regarded as the person himself. In the ancient world, Direct communication between important parties was rare. Diplomatic and political exchange usually required the use of an intermediary, a function that our ambassadors do today. The messenger who served as the intermediary was a fully vested representative of the party he represented. He spoke for that party and with the authority of that party. He was accorded the same treatment as the party would enjoy were he there in person. While this was the standard protocol, there was no confusion about the person's identity. Now that's a quote from a Hebrew Old Testament scholar, John Walton. He's commenting on Genesis chapter 16, the first time the angel of Yahweh appears in the Old Testament. Walton continues in this way. This explains how the angel in this chapter, Genesis chapter 16, can comfortably use the first person to convey what God will do. When the official words are spoken by the representative, everyone understands that he's not speaking for himself, but is merely conveying the words, opinions, policies, and decisions of his liege. That's a word for a feudal sovereign. So the messenger has the authority and the power given to him to convey a message and sometimes do the work. The Encyclopedia of Jewish Religion says, Therefore, any act committed by a duly appointed agent is regarded as having been committed by the principal. Okay, we can understand this. I might say Truman dropped the bomb on Nagasaki. I don't confuse the pilot and the bombardier with Harry Truman, but I know that Truman was behind it. He made the decision to do it, and by his power and authority, these other folks did it. In Semitic thought, the messenger representative was conceived as being personally, and in his very words, the presence of the sender. It's as if the sender was there. All the so-called mystery and confusion dissipates from the Old Testament passages that Seth and Golan look at once we understand that yud he vav hes messenger speaks and acts for yud he vav he as if the words and actions were yud he vav he himself. And we can see this idea in the New Testament as well. In every one of the Gospels, it's recorded that Jesus said this, Whoever receives me receives him who sent me. And the opposite of it, whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. You see, this is the language of agency. The agent is representing the power and the very presence of the one who sent him. Jesus cried out in John chapter 12. He's crying out, listen, Trinitarians. No. Of course, he didn't say that to Trinitarians. There were no Trinitarians then. John chapter 12, verse 44 and 45, Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And he who sees me sees him who sent me. Unquote. This is not a claim to be deity. This is a claim to be 
an authorized messenger, given authority and power from somebody else who has sent him. In John 14, 9, Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen God the Son. Again, I'm being sarcastic. Jesus said, Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Unquote. This is the idea of agency. And if our friends at One for Israel could just understand this, there's no mysterious idea of the unity of God with one person who is yud and another person who isn't yud who can be seen, who can't be seen. That's all unnecessary, confusing, non-biblical speculation. Instead, yud gives his messengers the authority and the power to speak for him and to act for him. See how this clears up all this confusion that the Trinitarian world has brought to the passages like in Genesis 18, where three messengers of yud heh appear to Abraham, and they speak with the authority in the first person of yud heh That's because we already know that these are yud heh messengers, and that yud heh is speaking and acting through these messengers. Golan and Seth, are you claiming that yud heh the God of Israel, is literally an angel, literally a messenger? Let me give you a very concrete example of agency from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 10. Isaiah, the prophet, is speaking to the king of Judah named Ahaz. And actually, it's yud heh the God of Israel, who is speaking to the Judean king Ahaz. And if we look at Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 10, we read, Again, yud heh spoke to Ahaz. Now, was yud heh the God of Israel, standing there physically, looking like a human being, speaking to Ahaz? We all can understand that yud heh spoke to Ahaz through his messenger, the prophet Isaiah. But it's yud heh speaking, the throat The voice, the words that come out of the mouth of the human person, Isaiah, are yud heh speaking. Isaiah is the God of Israel's messenger, and therefore when he speaks, it's the God of Israel speaking. Clarity, no confusion, no mystery about how many persons yud heh is. And also, people should know that Probably most often in the Bible, the angel of yud the angel of the Lord, or the messenger of yud they're human beings. For instance, Malachi chapter 2, verse 7, yud speaks, and he says this, For the lips of a priest, the Kohen, should guard knowledge, and men should seek instruction from his mouth, for he is the angel of of yud heh of hosts. Ki sifte kohen ishmaru da'at, v'torah yevakshu mipihu, ki malach adonai tzvaot hu. You see, the priests, the kohenim, are the angels of yud heh the messengers of yud heh the malach yud heh So, don't be so quick to say that the angels of yud heh are supernatural beings, because many times in the Bible, they are human beings who represent him, like we saw Isaiah the prophet. So, to summarize so far, the deity of Christ, the incarnation of God into man, is a man-made stumbling block. This is not a biblical stumbling block. This is not a correct presentation of the biblical Jesus. The stumbling block for the Jewish people in the Bible was that the Christ was crucified. Could people in the first century AD believe that the man, Jesus from Nazareth, had been put to death, but had been raised from the dead by God and made Lord and Christ? That's the question in the New Testament, not if God is triune. There's no declaration by the apostles in the New Testament 
that you had to believe that God is triune, and one member of that triune God became a man. Nothing like that in the New Testament. The question is, Mashiach Tzaluv, Christ crucified and raised from the dead by God. And secondly, agency, agency, agency. Deity of Christ believer, you need to do yourself a favor and understand what the idea of agency means. I know that as a Trinitarian Christian who even taught Bible to university and seminary students, I was not real familiar with this idea of agency. I think that Christianity tends to hide it, because once it's understood, we can understand very clearly who Jesus is claiming to be. We can understand what Jesus meant when he said things like this, I do nothing by my own authority. The words I'm speaking to you are the words of the one who sent me. The Gospel of John says Jesus was sent some 40 times. The Christology of the Gospel of John, who Christ is in the Gospel of John, the Christology is not incarnation, that one person of a God had literally became man. Rather, it's agency. God has sent Jesus. God has sent his Son. God was at work in Christ. This is the Christology of the Gospel of John. And as well, this so-called mysterious unity of God is not a biblical topic. This is something that's been made up by man in later centuries, post-New Testament times. And all this so-called mystery is lifted once we understand that yud heh vav the God of Israel, can speak and act through his agents, be they angels or human beings. And those messengers speak and act as if they are the presence of yud heh vav the God of Israel. So we'll stop there for now, and in the next session I'll continue with this response to the One for Israel video, and we'll discuss who Benjamin Sommer is, and why the One for Israel folks appeal to this somewhat liberal Jewish theologian for evidences that God is more than one person. And we'll also examine some of the verses in the Old Testament that Seth and Golan appeal to to find a mysterious unity of God. And then they'll as well turn to some of the supposed New Testament evidences that God is a trinity. So tune in next time as we continue to respond to the claim that the trinity can be found in the Torah. Yishma'u anavim ve'yismachu. The humble will hear and rejoice.